Hello there. It's me, Scott. This is not a proper introduction, so ignore me for a moment as I get the stream going and just make sure that everything is functional. Okay, it would appear that things are functional and that we have audio, so I'm going to bring in Nandini and David, and then we will start the stream for real. So there's Nandini, and there is David, and it looks like everything is good. So Nandini, if you want to take it away. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Nandini. I am, along with many other people, um, sort of part of a, an organization called SETI, a Creative and Emerging Technology Institute. Um, we do lots of things, sort of workshops, projects, um, but one thing we do is hackathons, and that's why we're here today. Um, a group of people as part of SETI are going to be doing a hackathon for the Winter Light Festival um, this weekend. So if you're watching, you should sign up and join if you're interested, if you have a project. Um, and the show will be as part of the Winter Light Festival in Portland um, from on February 5th. Um, the, the idea for the hackathon is that a whole bunch of people get together. Some have projects that are mostly complete. Some have projects that are partially complete. Some have no ideas at all. And we all get together and help each other finish. And we will work intensely this weekend and then disperse and sort of troubleshoot remotely and finish it all up for February 5th. Um, you can sort of participate both in person and remote in a mix, um, as lots of people are, as you'll see our next speaker. Um, and I'm really excited to, um, Scott will tell you more about David, but I'm excited to have um, David Lobser talk about this amazing um, VR project called Cosmic Sugar. Um, that will be part of the show. So um, watch, come to the show, and you'll get to experience and participate and and play a little bit with it. Um, and hopefully we will get to see David again later this spring or summer um, in some sort of capacity, a workshop, a project, something or the other. So um, I'll hand it off to Scott and I'm, right. I'm so Thank excited. You. And and really, um, if you can come to the hackathon and if not, definitely come to the show. Um, it's going to be really amazing. Um, it's gonna be in the second floor at Portland State University at the Ferry Boroughs Massey Hall. So um, more details on our website, study.institute. And I'll hand it off. All right, thank you, Nandini. Okay, I'll kick you off so you can go and get back to work. Thank you. Okay, so now I have to introduce David, which how could I possibly introduce David? He has such a hyphenate person. He does so many things that are hyphen separated, but I've known David for a lot of years now. I've known David as a um, kind of a, a he was in my cohort at, at ITP at NYU years ago. He since then has been a frequent collaborator, a, a friend, a creative partner. And he is going to uh, share today uh, a project of his he's been working on for some time called Cosmic Sugar. And I think it's a really great project to share in the context we're talking about, not only because it is just such an interesting, immersive experience, but I think it has interesting roots as part of a hackathon. But I think for a project that's representative of David, it's really an interesting one because it touches on so many things that he does. And so he'll go into that a little, little more, but it's got a little bit of like immersive VR, some sort of like sound healing, visual meditation. Um, also just like interesting tech and tools underneath with re really complex particle systems. And it's kind of an authoring art tool on, on top of all of that. So I will hand it over to David now. Are you ready to bring your slides up or do you have something you want to say beforehand? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a pretty good intro. So maybe I'll just pop right into the slides. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Add to stream. Okay, so if I so if I hit present, I'm not gonna be able to see you. So you'll have to tell me if uh, I am if this is looking good. So you see that full screen? I do looking see good? it full screen. It looks good. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, Cosmic Sugar uh, kind of has been a long evolving project. Um, you know, definitely not something that came out of uh, you know. It's, uh, a high concept at the beginning because like uh, you know very organic from the ground up um, I think the first inkling of my desire to work on on cosmic sugar came when I was at ITP with Scott and I like somebody explained how you could kind of ping pong textures on a GPU to uh, create GPU accelerated particle systems um, so you know at the time I was working in processing uh, just learning how to program 
And you could only have so many objects on screen at once. And the idea of being able to have lots and lots and lots of objects on the screen at once was pretty exciting. But it seemed like very much beyond my skills at that point. So uh, it took a couple of years of learning how to code. And I wound up at a music hackathon, um, which involved, it was like music, but also like music visualization to go along with it. So I was on a team with some musicians. And I thought, like, maybe if I just put my mind to it for a day, I can kind of get over that hump and make it happen. So I actually, um, uh, found some reference material and was able to modify it to do some of the basic stuff that I wanted it to do. But I guess uh, sort of going back to uh, my background, um, I uh, grew up in the 90s. Uh, so I tried VR for the first time during its kind of first, first big commercial boom when they were uh, selling Amiga-based VR stations for about $60,000 to arcades. Um, and you'd pay, I think, something like $15 for uh, 10 minutes to try Dactyl Nightmare. And... Um, you know, it lasted a few years until enough people realized it wasn't very good <laughs> before it it went away and we were left with uh, imagining VR and movies like The Matrix and, um, uh, and Lawnmower Man. Um, I actually just met the, the director of Lawnmower Man, um, which is pretty special. If you haven't seen that movie, it, it's worth a look. Um, so I, I studied film and animation and worked in the visual effects industry for a long time. And I just wanted to get out of that completely. So I went to ITP not knowing what it was going to be, but settled on code pretty quickly and got really interested in 3D printing because I thought that was going to be the thing, um, which it turned out to be not quite the thing that I thought it was going to be. But VR uh, became a thing just as we were both graduating uh, from ITP. And I connected with Ken Perlin, who you might have heard of. Uh, He's a legend in computer graphics. And he came up with the algorithm called Perlin Noise. Um, which is used in every graphics package that exists. Um, pardon me. Uh, more recently, I've been uh, especially interested in the healthcare space um, and using virtual reality to help people meditate and uh, improve their experiences while they're getting ketamine infusions. Um, I'm going to be starting work with a company that uh, works in oncology settings um, and things like that. So. Uh, I guess I can mention another project I have called Visitations, uh, which I would, um, which I'm hoping to uh, come present at SETI at some point in the future as well. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned some of this stuff. So uh, yeah, Cosmic Sugar just started at this music hackathon, and I just kept playing with it. So the first thing I did was like brought it home, put it on the TV, and just like hooked it up to a video controller and let people play with it. And I was into it. Um, I don't necessarily know if a project is good just based on whether or not I'm excited about something. Um, but in this case, like other people had as much fun as I was having just adjusting settings and like applying forces to uh, this crazy particle system. So I had some friends that work at a company called Lightbox in uh, Manhattan, and they are a, um, it's like a corporate event center where they have lined all the walls with projections. So we did a variety of projects at uh, Lightbox, including um, uh, visualizations for yoga classes, which uh, I think worked pretty well and people mostly liked it, but there is a um, kind of a state that Cosmic Sugar can get into where all the particles are rotating and I was knocking people off balance <laughs> by, by rotating the entire room when people were trying to do tree pose. So, you know, it's like, a lesson in UX right there. Um, so this is a music video. And I, I don't know if I'll play the whole thing, but maybe I'll play part of it. And maybe at the same time, maybe I can share the link uh, as well, in case you just want to look at it uh, on your own. Uh, should I, does, that, does that make sense, Scott? If I put it in the chat, are people going to be Yeah, throw it in chat. And then an, uh, after the fact, I can stick it in the, the, the YouTube description. And hopefully, we have audio here. Uh, any yes, audio? We have audio. Yep. Oh, it nice. appears to have audio. Great. Yeah. So this is a um, uh, a recent music video that I made with uh, a musician named East Forest. We've done a lot of collaborations over the years, and this music video uses the the tools that are available in Cosmic Sugar, but I keyframed them for this music video. Uh, so instead of using the controllers and doing a live performance, I sort of um, set them and animated them per frame, which was a slightly painful process because kind of had to uh, 
always rewind back to the beginning to actually see what effects my keyframes are really going to have later on. So can you hear me okay? Yes. So what's happening down here is I'm emitting particles from a circle, and then those are sort of passing into a, uh, a gravity field, which is causing them to kind of pass through themselves and then come back around again. Um, uh, this video is dome formatted, so I actually made it for a company that specializes in dome content. Uh, so this might wind up on tour at some point. How many particles is this? So when I was animating it, I set the particle count to be lower. So maybe like when I was actually doing it just for speed's sake, I had it set at 100,000 or a million. Um, I think that for the final render, um, this is either 8 million or 16 million, somewhere in there. I, I, I set it up as high as it could go, basically. So this final render, even though Cosmic Sugar is real time, this render took several hours. And the frames are 8K. So I think uh, it's like over 100 gigs for this video. I think I realized that the audio we're getting is coming from your speakers. And so you're speaking loudly, but I think it's fine. We'll, we'll make sure people have the link for it. OK. Uh, so let's see. Do I need to play the whole thing? I think that's good. Yeah, I don't think I need can, to play the whole thing. We can share it after the fact, and people can watch it in, in all its yeah. high-res glory. Yeah. So. Um, Pop back here. Um, so these are just uh, you know some screen grabs from Cosmic Sugar. I was uh, you know trying to pick some that I could kind of show uh, the variety of kinds of things that you can make. Um, it's a pretty difficult design tool. It's like I didn't exactly make it to allow artists to just sit down and, and make things that they wanted to make and you know the way that you can with tilt brush or or other art making tools it's kind of you know more like sort of you have a bunch of ink and you have a tank of water and you know you sort of splash the ink in the water and it's like you can't, you can't undo that all you can do is kind of play with the ink that's there um, so these fish like shapes are are come about as the result of just playing with a bunch of particles and then sort of tossing them around in space and and freezing the frame and then it's it's kind of like you know you look at clouds and you see shapes so i start with these kind of abstract shapes and then kind of tease uh you know bits and pieces out of them so it's like first you know it's like make a blob and then you know there is a tool that lets me sort of make these fin like shapes so it's kind of like make an abstract shape and then figure out kind of like how to tease things out of that, which is a very unusual way to work. And the only reason I've been able to make any images that look like anything is because I spent many hours experimenting with this stuff. And it, it, it may bear stating for, and I'm sure we can talk a little more about the tech, is that these are fully volumetric images. This is not just like a 2D canvas that you're splattering paint on. This is a 3D volume of millions of particles that you're kind of controlling you know, in mass to sculpt these these figures. Yeah, so d definitely like does like trying to work with Cosmic Sugar in a way to export two D images is a bit different than working with it in a way for volumetric images or you know a performance for yourself. Um, so yeah, it is it is very different experience to actually be in the space and to be able to walk around these and through these and to be able to manipulate them. Uh, this is kind of another genre of shapes, which are, you know, much more simple. Um, these are the result of just kind of like, you know, pulling them into a ball or a sphere and then, you know, just like having like one or two swoops kind of through the particle system and then freezing that in place. Um, so this is actually uh, is uh, a chunk of code from an earlier version of Cosmic Sugar. Um, but I just wanted to share this because it, it's kind of like, you know, the amount of code, like the amount of important code uh, that actually makes these particles do their thing is not actually, like there's not that much of it. So, you know, there's the physics part. Um, 
And then this entire part down here has to do with uh, drawing, like drawing lines versus drawing curves versus um, you know drawing lines between controllers, that kind of thing. Uh, so I realize that's probably too small to see, but uh, if anybody's interested, I can share some of those details. Um, so something that kind of came out of uh, playing with um, Cosmic Sugar is uh, there's there's this quality known as flow, which I think is important to know as a uh, uh, if you're designing interactive experiences, it basically has to do with engagement and the quality of experiences that that create engagement for people. Uh, so this is um, sort of comes out of the work of a psychologist named Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. And I think I did not know how to pronounce his name until uh, Ken Perlin <laughs> pronounced that at one point. And I was like, oh, that's, that's how you say that. Um, so yeah, basically the idea is you know, when you're doing something that is uh, difficult enough that it stretches you, but not too difficult, and it gives you immediate feedback, um, you kind of get into this state where you lose track of time. And, you know, there's a reason that, you know, at least for me, like, I, I don't always find it easy to relax on vacation, right? It's like, I kind of have an easier time getting lost in work. And it's like, you know, the, the kind of, if you have if you've had an experience where you're so engaged in something you look up from your screen or whatever you're doing five hours later and you and it felt like 10 minutes like that's when you're um, having this experience to flow and uh, my thought about cosmic sugar and you know I, I I would find this an interesting discussion to have if other people have ideas about this but I think that cosmic sugar has some intrinsic qualities that uh, make it easy to get into a state of flow um, as art tools go, it's, um, it's really hard to make the thing that you want in a way. So it, it kind of evens the playing field almost like it's, it's really easy to make something that looks pretty good and that's cool and satisfying. And the more you play with it, the more you kind of discover, uh, things that are aesthetically pleasing to you, um, without there being the same kind of, you know, external judgments that come from. You know, if you're learning how to draw, it's like you can tell if your drawing is not good really easily. Um, whereas almost everything in Cosmic Sugar is pretty good, so it, it kind of removes like uh, a certain amount of judgment that can prevent people from getting into a flow state. So, kind of on the therapeutic front, Cosmic Sugar was not designed in any way to be a therapeutic experience. But I think that because of some of its qualities, um, you know, it can create this experience of flow, at least for me. So I would be curious to hear what other people, um, uh, what kinds of experiences other people have. Uh, let's see, this is another video. I don't have to play all this. I just wanna look at it quickly to see. Okay, so this was actually, this came out of a, a fully live performance. So the other one was orchestrated and keyframed, and this one was just, um, uh, you know, being there live and playing with the controllers, and there are uh, there are secret ways to capture performances in Cosmic Sugar. So if you're interested in um, doing a performance with the controllers, uh, recording it, um, you can either play it back live, uh, you know, in a way where it can kind of easily be turned into its own app um, for people if you want to share a performance. Uh, and then if you record the performance, it can be played back on a frame by frame basis so that you can export the frames and make it a video that is as high resolution as you want it to be. And you don't have to worry about dropped frames and stuff like that. So some of those tools are in there. They're just like way under the hood. And at some point, if there's demand, I might um, make those more available. Um, let's see. Uh, so this is the original link, which is, unfortunately, the link is gone. So the person who made this um, decided to take their site down, sadly. But uh, that was actually where I sort of found some of the initial code that helped me create the first version of um, Cosmic Sugar. So that this was actually done in uh, Chrome um, with, uh, or on the web, like with WebGL using 3JS. Uh, and that first version used basically uh, two textures that, that ping ponged back and forth. So the first version of Cosmic Sugar basically had an image where each pixel, um, the RGB values would map to the XYZ uh, positions of each particle. And then the shader that 
control those positions uh, would do the math on each pixel and like write to one texture on one frame and write to the other texture on the other frame. And it worked pretty well. Uh, and I, uh, that was, you know, the first, uh, you know, the first three years of Cosmic Sugar were done using those tricks. Um, and it was easy to get a million particles to run. So, uh, you know, I was shocked when I actually was able to get it running in VR for the first time. Um, but, you know, ran smoothly, million particles, amazing. Um, but it was actually uh, another programmer, Nate Turley, who I've done some workshops with, who helped me figure out how to use compute shaders to speed it up. And, it, and the, I was able to, like, get it running much, much faster using compute shaders. And uh, Ken had Jaron Lanier, who is the person who coined the term virtual reality. And he... Uh, uh, I showed it to him and I was like, like, tell me what to do with this thing. And he's like, I, I don't know. You just have to put it out there. Like, you know, you make a thing and share it with people. And I think I was kind of at a place where I wanted to make it perfect and better in some way, but I didn't know what perfect or better looked like, but it was kind of already a thing. So without knowing where it was going to go, I was like, okay, I'm going to follow this genius's advice and just release it as fast as I can and, and see what happens. And I, I had like pretty good timing with that. And it was sort of one of the top free apps um, on Steam uh, for a while, I think just, um, uh, yeah. So it, it had more visibility, I think, in part just because I was able to get it up on the stores in the early days when there wasn't as much uh, VR as there is now. Uh, so um, freesound.org is great. Uh, I use it all the time. Uh, I tried to reach out to this artist, Patchen, who had you know posted all of the audio that I used, and they have disappeared. Um, and the tracks are like 10 years old at this point, but um, uh, they made some really good stuff. Uh, Scott Garner helps me a lot with my last version of Cosmic Sugar. Uh, he um, figured out how to save and load uh, point clouds really fast. So I'm not sure if I did the first version of that completely on my own or if you helped me with that too. Uh, but version one basically involved like reading all the data and converting everything to strings. And it was like a very slow process. And, Amongst other things, Scott figured out how to just like read the memory directly. So I, I don't know if you want to say anything about the, your contribution to Cosmic Sugar. Um, I just, maybe we finish this, and then I think it would be really interesting to talk about the tech, especially for people who are watching this who are beginners, and this may seem like way out of reach because I think Cosmic Sugar. A really interesting thing is the story of how it started from such like yeah, like a a Google Chrome experiment in a browser that level of sophistication to the thing that it is now, which is, it's, it's just vastly more, it's, it's so much faster, it's so much more complicated, but I'll, I'll let you finish. And then I think it would be good to kind of slightly deep dive on the technology a little bit. Uh, cool, yeah, and that, and you know, like I've been saying, that process has taken a long time. So it's just like, you know, you're like, one step at a time, like take a step, release it, take a step, release it. Actually that concept of, making a thing and putting it out there was very alien to me as an animator because as an animator you spend a huge amount of time making the perfect thing you know you test it with your friends you know you show it to a small audience of people whose opinion you really care about and you get it pitch perfect where you're like as happy as you can possibly be with every little thing and then you share it with people um and you know, what i've learned from getting into development is that's just not how things work. Like you, you share things when they're barely finished and you get feedback and you develop and, and there's like much more of a back and forth. And that's very much how Cosmic Sugar has, has gone. So there's a, uh, I have a friend who's a co cosmologist named Mark uh, Nyrink and he shared some, he, he helped me like parse some data from the positions of galaxies in the universe and positions of our closest stars. And you can actually load those up as point clouds in the most recent version of Cosmic Sugar. And um, it's pretty cool. I don't know, looking at the, um, there's a data set where you can see the closest 70,000 uh, galaxies. And it, I find it to be pretty breathtaking that you can just like see those points and like walk around them. And you realize like looking at this kind of weird abstract spongy shape you know, just like how massive uh, that is. Um, so that's pretty cool. So I appreciate uh, Mark sharing that with me. Mark and Anthony, who I should have also uh, put in there, also uh, shared a uh, point cloud of a, of a flower. And I found some other 3D models online that are there in the most recent version. Um, so uh, I have done um, some performances in domes. 
So to make it work in a dome, you just need to use a dome camera, which uh, sort of surprisingly was really easy to set up uh, with Cosmic Sugar. Um, for a dome camera basically requires that you uh, render a cube map first. So you know that means rendering it uh, six times over and then compositing that into one image. Uh, and uh, thanks to compute shaders, all of that works fast enough to be able to do uh, dome performances in real time. Um, this is something that you know I was I was playing around with, but you know there are these kind of cheesy sites you can go to, and you can get you can like upload a picture, and they'll kind of turn it into a, a volume, and like you know make these little points inside of blocks of um, plastic. So that's kind of on my uh, to do list to to take some cosmic sugar sculptures and and get those uh, engraved. Uh, so. Um, right now, everything is so it started off as as being a MIDI controlled experience, and it's fully VR. But MIDI has actually a lot of advantages over VR controls, especially if you're doing something uh, for a performance. So I would like to have a future version uh, include um, MIDI controls and the VR controls. Um, so yeah, just in general, like. Uh, it it makes for a pretty good live performance tool. I can share another video actually of somebody a uh, performance I did recently, or somebody was uh, telling a story about their um, uh, childhood. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like it was sort of it was a very strange match with Cosmic Sugar, and I think it made for a pretty interesting performance. Uh, this is like this is like a detail I want to figure out how to add, and this is kind of how Cosmic Sugar has been developed in general. Um, just like, all right, so I, I have this particle system and there's just some kind of goofy thing and I don't know if it's going to work, but I want to try it. Uh, and in the process of implementing that feature, I learned something, whatever I learned gets translated to something else. So uh, right now all the particles are always just quads. Um, and I want to figure out how to stretch those particles along the velocity, which seems like it should be pretty easy, but it's actually proving to be uh, pretty hard. Uh, so, you know, just like the universe started from nothing, as far as we know, and exploded out into a universe of stars, uh, cosmic sugar is nothing but stars, and it's possible that every time you load it up, you're creating a new universe. How would we know? I think, uh, I, think I might start a religion around that, and if you want in, send me some of your life savings, and uh, we'll talk about what level of the religion you get to be at with that. Um, just kidding. Not really. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, if you want to, so Light Clinic is um, uh, this relatively new entity, and it's it's kind of in the same way that I've been developing Cosmic Sugar uh, in a series of steps. Light Clinic is something that I'm developing in a similar way where, it's, where I have some products, and then I also am working with clients in the same space. Uh, and I am in the process of trying to figure out exactly what Light Clinic is and, and what it's going to be. So right now under Light Clinic, you can see my other project visitations in addition to Cosmic Sugar. And Scott and I are both working on a commissioned project from HTC for their new headset about dreams that will be getting released um, possibly as soon as a week or two from now. Uh, I think that these short URL links actually didn't work. So I might have to update this stuff. But if you're interested in the presentation, I can send you a link to this. Uh, and also, if you're interested in the latest uh, PC version, it's actually more recent than the one that's on Steam. Um, there is a Quest version, and I'm going to share some key codes for the Quest version. Quest version is great, and I love it. Um, only 100,000 particles. The PC version, I think, I, I think the highest you can do is 8 million, if not 16 million particles. And it's definitely a different experience um, working with uh, a lot more particles than you can on the Quest. Um, so thanks. Uh, that's my email. I do have like so I have this one other deck, so I'm just going to share this really quick. Uh, let's see. Oh, is this the one? Oh, uh, you know, I think I need to load it up. Should I? Hold on a second. Should I do that okay, or I can you do whatever it? you want? I, yeah. I can remove your. I'll remove that for one moment while you sort it out and you tell me how to add it back. And while you do that, I want to say thank you for sharing that. I think, I, I mean, the, the hardest thing to communicate, I feel like showing Cosmic Sugar like this, just as stills and as videos, is what it is like to be inside it and what it is like to be in this immersive environment of tens, hundreds, millions, sorry, tens, 
of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of particles fluidly responding is, is, is a pretty stunning thing. And it's the, the closest thing you could, I, I could maybe liken it to is like being able to sculpt with smoke or with water or something that is like a dense particulate material. And so there, there's not a lot else like it that I have experienced. And um, so I would definitely encourage anyone who can to, if you have access to a VR headset, get the Quest version, get the Steam version, try those out. Or if you are in Portland, come to SETI for the hackathon. I will, I will throw up the link so you can learn a little more about our winter lights. Uh, at SETI.institute, if you scroll down a bit, there's a link to info on the hackathon, which starts tomorrow. And then in two weeks, February 5th, I believe, but check the link to make sure that's true, will be the actual event. Um, OK, and now I will remove this. Was that enough stalling? Uh, perfect. Way? Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Perfect timing on the stalling. Excellent. Okay. So yeah, these are so from the last version of Cosmic Sugar, which is the one that's available on Steam now. I've been working on some additional features, some of which um, you know just kind of played off of existing features. So uh, the first feature that was there in Cosmic Sugar was just gravity. So you know suck the particles in and push them out. So shell kind of does the same thing. So it'll suck them into a point, but if it's you know, within a certain threshold, it will sort it will push them away. So there, so it kind of creates a shell by pushing from a certain distance and and you know pulling from a different distance. And it was like a very tiny tweak to an existing force. You know, just like a very slight change in the math. But you know, I got like a really different and interesting tool that um, uh, has like really different interactions than than the tools that it came from. Uh, so tornado, uh, I think, is the one that I was. Is, I think I'm the most excited about. That was something that I had been thinking about for a long time. Uh, this one basically combines a tool that was there in the original one, which is a rotational force, uh, which involves basically doing a, a matrix transformation on the velocity. So I sort of combined an existing tool that I had, and then also an attraction to a line segment which I didn't know how to do on my own. I did find somebody else's code to attract to a line segment. Uh, and then those two forces, like just, you know, I didn't know how that was really going to work. So that was that was some guesswork, but it, it worked out pretty well. Uh, and then I, like, I have a dream, which I have not been able to figure out how to implement yet, which is a toroidal force, which would be kind of like a tornado, but in a circle. Uh, and I kind of almost got that working, but it was too hinky to like really uh, get going in there. So. The current torus force is more like a simple distance uh, function, but with a torus instead of a, a sphere, basically. So then you can also stamp with uh, presets uh, point clouds. And I have a squiggle tool, which kind of draws noisily as you squeeze down. And uh, you know these other, these other tools kind of just like came out of a base set of, um, of drawing tools. So it was you know, relatively simple to add most of these, except for the tornado. The tornado was hard, but otherwise, like all of the other tools are the result of tweaks to existing tools. So I guess another example of uh, iterative development. So I think this this feels like a good segue to me for something I would like to talk about. How are you on your, you have more you want to say, or can I like start needling you for information? Uh, I think I'm good. I think I said okay. everything else. Cool. Yeah. So can we go back to that? Because I think it's I think it's a pretty interesting thing. And I want to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned before. So I think looking at these, and for people who still are trying to wrap their heads around what this is, and, and I would I'm really interested in talking about this thing selfishly. <laughs> if you look at these as tools that are available to you, and then think about tools that you, you know, painting and drawing tools you might be familiar with, like Photoshop or Illustrator, Inkscape, whatever it is you use, where you might have like, okay, here's the brush. Here's the pin tool. Here's the eraser tool. Here's the rectangular marquee. You know, there's there's kind of this set of 2D drawing tools that we've had for 30 years, something like that, for for decades and decades that have been kind of found foundational to many, many, many graphics packages and so many graphics packages that build on top of, you know, the original tools that were in Photoshop 25 years ago. Um, but when you look at these, you know, there's no there's maybe like some stuff in Illustrator, like swirling distorts and things like that, but you don't have the basic, you don't have those conventional tools, right? So it, it, this, and I, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that the intent was never to make Cosmic Sugar like a 3D Photoshop, you know, like where, whereas maybe Tilt Brush does want to be that or Medium wants to be a, a, a sculpting tool for that. So you have these things that are, 
everything that happens in Cosmic Sugar is passed through like a lens of your intent. So the, with these, I, I think these tools illustrate that well, like you're interested in this Taurus force, this tornado, this stamping tool. And so I think about this a lot in my own work and I'm interested on your, your take on it is tools as art is sort of a complicated thing. And if you're telling someone, well, you can use this thing I made to make a thing, the, people often think of that in terms of like, oh, it's a tool. It's like Photoshop or GarageBand or whatever tool it is. And I'm going to have an idea and I'm going to make that thing. And that's not really what Cosmic Sugar is necessarily. That's not like, for me, that's not what Velotic is and some of the work that I do. And so I'm interested on your feeling of this where you're not making a tool for people to make whatever they want. It's almost like you're making a tool for people to kind of collaborate with your intention. So I'm just curious what your view on that is. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I, I think that, you know, sort of my, I guess my attitude toward that has also been developing over the process of, you know, creating cosmic sugar, because, you know, it's like a lot of it. Um, it's like, as I've been adding features, they have been features that have seemed missing to me, I guess, as I, as I've got, as I've gotten into it. And when other people sort of go in and experience those features, it's like, uh, it is like kind of a piece of art unfolding. It's like they're, they're reading a book or, you know, they're exploring a sculpture in a certain way where there is a very different kind of relationship with an audience to something like an animation where it's like, you know, this is, there's a time bracketed thing with a beginning and an end. Um, in this case, yeah, it is, it is a curated experience um, that people are meant to interact with in a really different way. So, yeah, I, I kind of wish you had asked me that question earlier because I've... No, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I want to, I think we should have a talk about this because I think there's other people we could bring in. And actually, the person... So maybe another way to put it for anybody who doesn't quite understand is in lots of this realm, for things that I do, for David does, it, it's very frequent, very frequently we make tools to facilitate some part of a job or project or process. And they're often extremely bespoke tools. Like David has libraries of tools that are just David tools that he uses to make things. Some of those tools get reused frequently. Some of them are just for one effect of one job. I think speaking of Ken Perlin and Chalk Talk, this incredible presentation tool that is basically exists only for Ken to use and kind of, I, if he's still working on it, um, almost like another human couldn't use it. But I think there's something special about these kinds of tools that are like, okay, I'm a kind of person that makes things to make things. David often makes things to make things. But what happens when you share the thing you made to make a thing with your intent? So anyway, I, I just wanted to present that. I think that would be a super fascinating talk to have in the future um, because I've gotten selfish about it where it's like, no, this is, it's my art. I created this thing. If you're creating something too, you're in the scope of the thing I've created. And I think of, I do it a lot with music where like you mentioned with Cosmic Sugar, it's kind of whatever you do will look good, but that's not an accident. It's because you've kind of put the rails on that keep that true. So anyway, big diversion, but super interesting topic that would be great to talk about in the future. Um, okay, like quickly, um, oh, like what, do you, what, what do you think of the term sandbox for like that whole genre? Well, I think that's interesting, except, I mean, that's a whole other thing because sandbox has a meaning in game design already that is not un- it's not totally dissimilar, right? Like many people would say there's precursors to it, but Minecraft, Minecraft as a creative sandbox, as an example, and then everything in the Minecraft family tree. Um, but I don't think anybody, well, maybe they do, but generally if someone makes something interesting in Minecraft, they are viewed just kind of fully as the author of that. And Notch, the original creator of Minecraft is, is not part of the like authorial statement about it, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's in the right world, but I, I don't know. I don't know what to call it yet. Um, I mean, they're definitely like, you know, a lot of tilt brush artists, but they, you know, they, they would call themselves tilt brush artists because, you know, a, a project that comes out of tilt brush is very different than uh, quill or, you know, medium sure. or, or sort of like some of those other tools. So I think yeah. And I think that, I think you're, those are in the wheelhouse. They just feel a little different because they don't have maybe like the individual intent intent in my opinion, that's something like Velotic does or something like Cosmic Sugar does that is a little bit more like somebody made this thing and they're making things with it and they're letting you make things with it too. And that's, I, you know, right now it's coming out of my mouth as that very like selfish, like artist statement version of it. But I really waver on it because sometimes I feel like that's not the right 
the right view. But I would, I think we should put a pin in that and talk. You should think about it more, and we should get some other people and, and have a talk about it because I think it's a pretty interesting subject. Um, I do want to latch on a little bit to something you said really early on because I think this is just an important statement for people, especially going into the hackathon. Um, you said something about you, you, you made this early version of it. You were excited about it, but you didn't know if other people were going to be excited about it. And that's always like a really tricky thing. Um, I think I've tried to convince myself that if there's something I'm excited about, the fact that I'm excited about it means that somebody somewhere else is going to be excited about it, even if it's only five people. Um, but I'm curious, like how that arc has gone for you with Cosmic Sugar, like starting as something that you really just did because you personally found it interesting at ITP and you're learning to code, you're learning all this stuff. And now it is a tool that like seems to make an impact, like people people have impactful experiences with it. So that's a pretty interesting arc from just like an experiment that was so personal to something that is now out in the world in this way. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess something that I've always struggled with a bit uh, with Cosmic Sugar is that I don't exactly feel like an author <laughs> in the same <laughs> way that I do with other projects where it's like, you know, more more contained if you know there's like a narrative where it's where there's a specific experience that I want people to have. So um you know there's the simplest version of Cosmic Sugar really started off as a tech demo in a way. And I've I've just been kind of you know massaging it in a way where I've been as much as possible trying to get out of the way, you know, just like kind of trying to make a nice space. Um, but not so much the kind of experience that I have tried to make with other things that I've made. So I think it's 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 unique in that regard, uh, you know, in how how different it is for me and like my relationship with Cosmic Sugar versus other things. You know, I don't think of myself as much of I don't think of Cosmic Sugar as much of an artwork. You know, it's like it's something else. So I don't know exactly you know, yeah. what, the, what the right well, term is. I think. Is. I mean, I can definitely see that that's confusing. I can tell you from an outsider's perception with this and with visitations both, I would class them as artworks because even if the intent isn't like about what's on screen, I think in both of those cases, it, from my outside perception is you have a very specific kind of like feeling and state of mind you want another person to experience, which to me is like the definition of art is like, I have a feeling in me and I want to put it in you. And I feel like even talking about, you know, the, the, the flow state in Cosmic Sugar, where the, you know, visitations we can have a whole nother stream about, but like the feelings that you put in there, I think you have an intent the way you would with a narrative of, I want to, I want you to feel a thing. You, this is just like a very different way of putting someone there. Does that, is that fair to say, or is that totally off base? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of that came out of like, what is my feeling of interacting with these particles and how can I kind of amplify that feeling that I'm having? Um, you know, by like fine tuning the way the particles work and, you know, by getting the colors just right and by getting the music just right, trying to like make the interactions as, as simple as possible. So I think that, you know, in that way, it's, you know, there are projects where, you know, there, I, I want to create an experience for people and it kind of like starts from that. Uh, in this case, it's like I'm working with a medium and I want to um, expand on and intensify uh, an experience that I have of that medium. So yeah, like uh, more, orga more organic, I guess, than, yeah. than a lot of other projects I've done. So I'm, I mean, I think we should talk more about this because I'm super into it. I want to be respectful of your time. So I think the next thing I want to talk about, and again, this is probably something that bears a deeper dive, is I'm sure there's plenty of people watching this that don't really understand what the word particle system or the phrase particle system means or what these forces mean or what any of that means. And so... I mean, do do you have like a quick back of the box summary of like how would how would you describe this to you know someone who had no experience of like simulating particles on a GPU doesn't doesn't even know what a GPU is? How would you describe the technology that is behind this? Uh, yeah, you definitely don't need a GPU to make a particle system. The idea with a particle system is that you have uh, a manager of uh, lots of kind of like dumb objects that you know don't have. Uh, necessarily very sophisticated behavior, but because of the fact that they are, you know, part of a collection and they have this relationship to each other that uh, is managed by this manager, you can create, uh, you know, really complex interactions. So um, smoke uh, is a particle system, uh, explosions. I mean, it's a, it's a specialty in the, in the visual effects realm where you're basically 
uh, emitting things, destroying things, and then things happen to these uh, you know particles over a period of time. Um, you know, even uh, as scientists are working on um, uh, COVID, uh, New York Times had this amazing article about how they are kind of figuring out how COVID works, and they actually take all of the atoms inside of uh, a single um, COVID virus cell. Do you call it a cell? I guess just a virus, <laughs> and they've actually like turned it into a particle system. So you know, in that case, the particles like there's more different kinds of particles, and they have more complex kinds of interactions, but they just like, like run them all at once, uh, basically. So. Um, on a CPU, the way a CPU works is like one instruction after the next per frame. Um, and you can do all the same calculations that I'm doing to, you know, get these particles to do uh, this stuff with compute shaders. Uh, you're just limited to the number of particles you can have on screen at once just because of the way CPUs work. So to uh, move it to the GPU, uh, GPU, you know, it's like the architecture of a GPU is set up so that... Uh, different parts of the processor will handle, you know, pixels individually or vertices individually, and they're fine-tuned uh, to do things with vectors and matrices. Uh, so if you push it onto the GPU, instead of sort of simulating one particle at a time, you're doing all of these things at once. And Mythbusters has this great episode where they describe the difference between CPU and GPU, and CPU is like spitting out like one paintball at once, and then you know, they have this, this giant machine with a million uh, paintball guns and they shoot at the Mona Lisa in one go. So that's kind of, you know, what GPUs are. So the same math that, you know, like these processors were designed to make games go faster, basically. So the same math that calculates the colors and the shading of geometry that go up on the screen can be repurposed um, to these different uses. So normally with games, you're using fragment shaders and vertex shaders. A shader is just a program that runs on the GPU, uh, but with these other kinds of shaders like tessellation shaders or you know, geometry shaders or compute shaders, you can use that, that infrastructure to do different things. Um, so yeah, you can like just run uh, much more complicated programs uh, um, on arbitrary kinds of data. So these particles have, you know, instead of just RGBA, like a pixel on your screen, they have position and velocity and age and color and like initial position, um, you know, all different kinds of variables. You plug that stuff in and just by, you know, setting some initial conditions, um, the math to do, to make an attractor is actually really simple. Um, you know, it's just like finding a direction from where I am to where I want to go, applying some velocity, um, keeping track of that uh, from one frame to the next. And you, uh, you can do just like, a, a lot with uh, a lot more things. You are limited to the kinds of things you can do, or it's a lot trickier to do the kinds of things that you might want to do on a CPU. Like having particles talk to each other becomes uh, a more complicated chore. Um, but it, it opens up a lot of possibilities, kind of moving your thinking from CPU space to GPU space. And I think uh, one of the things that just strikes me, I mean, the first versions of this, at least that I had exposure to, and I mean, we should probably get out of like GPU land after this statement and go a little bit higher level for people that are new to this. But like one of the things that was always funny to me early on to like cheat, to cheat, to use just a vertex fragment shader for compute, basically these simple programs that are really designed to say how a triangle looks on screen, right? That's kind of what the purpose of these programs at their simplest level is I'm going to draw a triangle and I'm going to say what the surface of that triangle looks like is the is the simplest version of this but you know people would do all kinds of interesting things and i think maybe early versions of cosmic sugar or an early gpu accelerated version did this where you can send textures to the gpu kind of with the idea of you know superficially saying like oh i'm going to send a checkerboard texture and that's how we want my triangle drawn right like obviously i'm going to give you an image and you're going to put it on screen but you're you're not limited to that at all. You can cram whatever you want into those pixels. So I, I'm pretty sure, is that true that early Cosmic Sugar really, I mean, at least when you got into GPU land was you're encoding lots of secret information inside of an image and then the GPU doesn't know the difference. It just knows that it's dealing with essentially kind of like a pixel. I guess it's a texel at that point. Does a bunch of math on it 
And even though it might think it is an a, a, a image, you know, one pixel on an image, it's actually a position in space. So that was always fascinating to me. But you've moved out of that, right? Now Cosmic Sugar is fully compute at this point. Yep. Yeah. So version one was, you know, two one uh, K textures that would ping pong back and forth because all you need to know is a previous frame to you know do all this stuff with physics. Uh, and the current version, yeah, it doesn't do that. And it's much faster running uh, with compute versus uh, doing that. So, OK, if we've lost anybody because that was a little bit too deep, I want to take a minute and, and just realize like where this started could not have been more simple. Like totally, I mean, David, you really were brand new to programming basically at ATP when you were starting some of this stuff. So it's not like this is not, I mean, and granted it's taken many years to get where it is now, but there's a version of this that you can start with. And so I want to take a minute if we can, and I would, so I want to be respectful of your time. So I maybe we talk a little more about tech and then are you up for a short demo? Yeah, for sure. Cool. So I think, we would be remiss to mention particle systems in ITP without mentioning Dan Schiffman, right? Like I think um, for anyone who's not familiar with Schiffman, he is a a prolific uh, educator at ITP who, and outside of ITP really with Nature of Code and Coding Train and all of these other things that he's done um, really about making, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say because it's so broad. Broad. I was going to say like computer graphics really accessible, but it's way more than that. He's associated with processing, with P5. And so I did want to just jump in and point out a couple of things. If you have no idea what we're talking about and you want a place to start, I would personally probably recommend P processing or P5JS, which were kind of the lineage goes all the way back to an MIT project by uh, Ben Fry and Casey Reese to figure out how to let artists code and you know programmers make art that was kind of the original conceit all the way back with processing before 1.0 and that has led through the years to where we are now with p5 you can run it in the browser um shipments on tons of, of of tutorials he has an amazing youtube channel called the Toad coding train that is worth watching just for the intro it's incredible um he also wrote a book at, it was really why we were at itp so called the nature of code very much focused on these kinds of things like with the premise being like you know these things that are happening in the real world particle simulations birds flocking smoke water are incredibly complicated to try to describe as they exist in the real world but but coming up with approximations for them is something that like artists and computer scientists have been doing for years for games for simulations for all kinds of things and so jumping into the coding train you can find all kinds of videos for, I mean, everything basically, including some of the stuff we just talked about today. Like some of the things like some of the forces that we talked about today, some of the things like, um, I mean, just the idea in here, I'm pretty sure is flocking and different kinds of particle simulations. And so I would say anybody who's just getting started, Coding Train is a great resource. You could go all the way back to the beginning of the Nature of Code videos, or if you just go to the Coding Train homepage or go to the YouTube channel, just start at the beginning and Schiffman will, will start you off at a very uh, manageable level. And uh, I mean, yeah, I, I really can't say enough good things. David, do you want to jump in with anything on that? Uh, yeah, totally concur. Dan Schiffman's a total gem and his videos are amazing. Uh, I was lucky enough to take Nature of Code at ITP. And yeah, I mean, basically um, the, the most important parts of what go into cosmic sugar I learned in that class and you know it's like the the, the hardest part since then I've really just been about plumbing um, so you know it's like I think you don't necessarily need to you know if you're coming at this from a design perspective which is where I was coming at all of this stuff from it's like you don't necessarily need to like learn everything you don't need to know like all of these details but if you're coming at it from a design perspective every little thing you learn, um, you're going to be bringing your artistic and your design perspective to it. And you're going to be able to make it sing in ways that, you know, people who are coming at it from, you know, a purely technical place, like they're not necessarily going to come, you know, find the same outcomes that you do coming at it uh, as a designer. And I think, I mean, and, and on that topic, there's lots of room, particularly at this hackathon or in other contexts at ITP was a frequent thing, certainly, is for those two, like, that could be two people, you know, that could be the person that has the design sensibility and the person that has a bit more of the like code or engineering 
sensibility, figuring out how to do things together can also be very fruitful if you are that kind of person. So don't be too intimidated. You can find somebody to kind of help you with either one side or the other. Um, that maybe the, the part that you're more intimidated by, you can find someone who has the opposite intimidation level and, and pair up. Um, one thing I would like to mention with P5.js, so that was really, I mean, I would say spearheaded by Lauren McCarthy. Again, that was around the time we were at ITP. It's really matured since then. And so much of the power previously that you would have to run the standalone processing Java application, you go to processing.org, does that all get shared? Yeah. So you can go check out Download Processing. I'm sure there'll be people using Processing. I'm sure we will, SETI will certainly have some tutorials in the future related to Processing, but in particular, uh, P5, which is kind of takes all the, the power and flexibility of Processing and lets you do it all in JavaScript and web browsers. It's very portable. Um, and speaking of browser and JavaScript, I did want to show one thing. I realized I don't think we quite finished this thing, um, but something I did work on with David last year was this, uh, 3JS visualizer for um, Cosmic Sugar. And so I think I think I have a sugar file here I can drop in. Yeah, so the idea, and maybe this, I just wanted to, to pull something up that I could move around in 3D a little bit to kind of hopefully help illustrate what these things really are. So navigation in uh, high scores, maybe not the best, but you can kind of see it really is just a lot of dots. And each of those dots is a coordinate in space, which in this case is basically being rendered as a little a little square that is always paint pointing towards you. And that little square has a little image of a little like star particle on it. And that's kind of that's kind of all there is to it. I mean, if you want to reduce it to the simplest form, it's a bunch of little quads pointed at you, right? Is Cosmic Sugar, are you manually drawing those quads? Is that are you just building a quad that you draw, or how do you do that? Uh, draw instance mesh, yeah. Like okay. a, the, the shader deals with uh, orienting to the camera. OK, cool. So I mean, this is, and again, this once you're in the millions or tens of millions of particles, you're managing all this on the GPU, it gets a little complicated to, to build that from scratch. But you don't necessarily have to build that from scratch. You can either kind of start out a little simpler with a lower number of particles, do it in P5, totally manageable. I did also want to point out the um, for people interested in Unity, the Unity VFX graph. They call it a VFX graph. Under the hood, it really is just a um, GPU accelerated particle system. Um, I think it's a little weird. I don't know. I guess they called it VFX graph to kind of differentiate it from uh, their the normal view of what a particle system is in Unity. But you can do very similar things. You know, very similar things to what you've seen today in Cosmic Sugar, but you can do it in kind of a graphical node-based system. David, we actually, uh, David and I recently worked on a project um, that was kind of a dense particle simulation system that we 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 use VFX graph for, and it's 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 pretty powerful, pretty flexible, and pretty easy to get started with. So if you're totally like you just can't deal, you love you want to play with all the particles, the code part sounds really intimidating. Uh, diving into VFX graph or looking into that, if you if you are interested in Unity, might be a, a, a good place to start. Is there anything you want to uh, add to that, David? Uh, yeah, definitely two thumbs up to learning how to program with node graphs. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, with different programs uh, that are node graph based. Um, I guess specifically uh, Nuke as uh, a compositing program that is actually uh, pretty sophisticated. Uh, learned a lot from that. And it's like once you kind of learn once you understand the logic uh, that goes into how these things are put together via node graphs, then it's some um, it's it's much easier once you get into code. Then you're like, oh, it's like, you know, these three lines of code are like those ten nodes that I had over there. So, you know, I I um, have a preference for coding for various reasons, including that I spent so much time working in node graphs in my previous life. Um, you know, also there's uh, you know, it would be nice if the node graph allowed you to like write your own expressions easily. Uh, so, you know, there are things that, you know, you can do in a couple lines of code, like, you know, not that many characters that require a lot of nodes, but it's a way more accessible and it's a lot more fun too. You know, it's like once you kind of get some of the basics down, you know, trying things out, changing things around. Um, and there are just a lot of things with the node graph that are a lot like way easier than trying to do with compute shaders. Um, but, you know, you do kind of like bump into uh, things where it's it's just like not as flexible uh, at a certain point. So if you're okay and with you, like some limitations, then you also have to 
put yourself in the shoes of the designer of the node graph, I guess, is the thing I run into a lot. It's sort of to, to, you know, you know how to do a thing and you want to do it, which is maybe a problem for us because we have more of the background of doing all this stuff through code that you kind of have to like, I would, I guess I would say it's a little easier to go from a node-based world to a code-based world than the other way around because you'll feel a bit constrained in the code-based world, sorry, node-based world if you know how to do it in code already. But if you are just starting out, especially if you're interested in Unity, Unity has a node-based editor here for the VFX graph, also a node-based editor for their shader graph, just for you know general shading of objects. Um, and they also, uh, in preview, well, I think they bought Bolt, but in preview, they do also have a node-based programming system. So basically, Unity is headed towards a, a future where you can do everything or nearly everything either through visual node-based systems or through writing code or through some combination of the two. So, Good thing to keep in mind if you just, I, I would say, you know, there's a, a particular kind of person who just, I don't believe it's true, but may just feel like they'll never program, they'll never be able to code, they just don't get it or don't want to get it or don't try. If you are a person that feels that way, I would encourage you to consider looking at some node-based tools, especially if you are someone from a visual arts background or like a, you know, CG or animation background where you may have already used, like David mentioned, nodes, node graphs in something like Nuke, in something like Maya Hypershade, where you already have a familiarity with it. Um, that, that was definitely me. I'll say like, you know, I really thought that I was the kind of person that was just never gonna be able to learn how to code because I like, I didn't do it when I was 12 and it was gonna be too late, but I, I didn't pick it up till I was uh, 32. And that's pretty much been my job since then. So unless there's anything else you wanna touch on, I think, First, to, first of all, thank you, thanks again for going through this. Thanks for indulging me in my my sidetrack questions. I think we I would like to revisit some of these things on a, on another stream, maybe with a few more people. We can have a little panel. Um, but if you we're kind of over time, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of a cosmic sugar sugar demo for for people that might not be able to 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 run it or come to the show. Uh, yeah, are there people here who can make requests, or uh, or is it just you that's making requests? Uh, I, there's a couple people in chat. So if anybody's in chat that wants to make a request, uh, David can can draw a drawing for you. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you can just go where your heart takes you. So I will let you get that set up. And um, in the meantime, I will remove this and I will remind everyone to visit, if I can find the right thing. Well, first visit CosmicSugarVR.com. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, so CosmicSugarVR.com. You can find videos, pictures, you'll find links to download it on all the stores it's on. I think you actually, something we didn't even really talk about, you touched on it, but was this dome experience where you had some, you had cosmic sugar in the dome, but then you also had a person kind of in the dome performing basically with cosmic sugar. I just want to actually show a still of that because I think it's pretty striking. So our hope is um, to have uh, Okay, give me a moment while I type. Sorry, you can listen to my keyboard. Our our our, our hope is to uh, maybe not quite so extravagant, but aim for something like that at the uh, at the Winter Lights Festival. So, hopping back here for a second, David's very impressive uh, trailer, but I'm really striking to have someone sort of using it in VR while it is simultaneously uh, projected behind you. So we're going to aim for something maybe not quite this luxurious um, at Winter Lights. So I uh, definitely go grab that. Also, speaking of winter lights, go to seti.institute and you can find more information on participating in the hackathon over the next three days. Um, and then, you know, if you're not going to participate, you're certainly encouraged to come check out the show uh, on the 5th of February. And all that information, again, is at seti.institute. And now I will add this. And I think we see this. And I think we're getting audio from your speakers, which I think is OK. But um, yeah, I was thinking maybe I should turn those down. I'm trying to remember if I have, if I still have this volume button in there. Uh, let's see. So we're actually, David has an, is this an Oculus Quest 2 at the moment? Uh, it is a Quest 2, yeah. So okay. this is it, hooked up to my PC, though. So Oculus Quest 2, which there is a version for the Oculus Quest 2, but that's not what we're seeing right now. This is actually the the PC version, and you're using Oculus Link to play it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And then one uh, unfortunate disclaimer is that video compression hates particle simulations kind of more than anything. So what you're seeing on screen is only a fraction of the quality 
um, that you would see if you uh, if you were able to download it and try it or come check it out at the at SETI. Um, so yeah, actually, so Cosmic Sugar started, you know, kind of with the intent of it being on screens, and that's where it was for uh, for a while. So VR is a, a little late breaking. So it, it is like you know, it, it works well as you know something that is made to do for other people. So I just turned on an internal camera that I have to go now find. It's like <laughs> under my table. <laughs> Let's see where is it. Okay, so so I'm grabbing a camera in VR. Uh, and what you're seeing is the output of that camera. So if I just put that there, it's no longer seeing uh, what's in my headset, but I can kind of perform to. Oh, cool! I didn't know that was a camera. feature. Oh yeah, there's like a lot of a lot of hidden stuff in there. So I can, okay. I can, I can even take off my camera if I can find something to block the light sensor. Let's okay, see. could you do two things for me really quickly? Could you hide your Chrome sharing thing by clicking hide and then move the mouse pointer off the screen? Because I'm sure that will drive someone crazy in the future when they watch this video. All right, there we go. OK, awesome. OK, so now we have a live performance. Uh, so this is, you know, this is like the first tool, easiest thing, the gravity tool. And sorry, how many particles is this? Uh, this is a million particles. One million particles and running at 90 hertz. Uh, well, my screen is set to 60, so okay, I don't think 60. it's running any more than that, yeah. Uh, but it will, it'll run 100,000 particles on a Quest 2 at 72. Okay. Um, so let's see, should I, should I go through the different tools? I mean, I yeah, whatever really you'd like to do. Look. You don't have to spend a ton of time. I just thought it would be neat to let people kind of see what it is like to use it um, if they don't have an opportunity to do so. so. Yeah, so I think it's fun to combine a force in one hand and a drawing tool in the other. Uh, so let's see, this is like, uh, you know, sort of drawing these lines and then attracting them to a shell. And something that might bear stating is that when you say draw, drawing in Cosmic Sugar isn't necessarily, you're not adding particles, right? There's always the same number of particles. You're just sort of like grabbing particles from that pool and telling them to be in a certain place. Is that fair to say? Yep, always pulling particles from the end. So that is like, you know, it kind of frustrates some people when they're doing a beautiful drawing and then the particles are kind of getting pulled off the end. But, the, you know, there does unfortunately have to be a limit to the number of particles. So, so it's some conservation of matter in, in, in cosmic sugar land where you can only have yeah, so many. Typically, uh, particle systems you do, like, you know, uh, uh, generally you spray particles and those particles get destroyed at some point. That's just, you know, a, a standard thing uh, with particle systems. But with uh, cosmic sugar, it's always just been set up to where all the particles are there at the beginning and you're always playing with all the particles. Um, you can also, so this is, you know what I was talking about with sort of making those fish. Uh, there's a way to freeze the particles. So if I'm doing something like this, I can basically squeeze one of my mm. grips and then it, it, it sticks wherever it is. And then I could say, all right, well that looks like uh, whatever. And then I can, you know, kind of draw uh, on top of that a little bit if I wanted to. Um, so that's just like regular drawing. This is uh, drawing with two, um, uh, a line between uh, two controllers, which I, don't, I haven't seen in uh, other VR drawing tools, but. Um, I, it reminds me of 90 screensavers, so I instantly love it. Yeah. <laughs> so can I, you, um, while, while you're here and kind of frozen, do you have the ability to kind of grab this whole system and rotate it around or, or like to let people have a sense of how this is a volume? This is not just a, okay. Yeah. yeah so this is a, this is a, a, a volumetric sculpture. This isn't just like, yeah. you know, flat particles on a, on a canvas. And that's me grabbing the camera. But if I just, if I turn off the camera then I'm, and I'm back in, you know, it's like, uh, uh, with my headset. It's always hard to stream and capture VR in a way that isn't a <laughs> little uh, chaotic and insane. Uh, so these are all the tools. So um, there are forces. And then if you click, you can go to these drawing tools. So I have uh, added circle drawing. The circles will orient to the other controller. Um, so that, you know, that was 
that that feature where the circle orients to the other controller just came about via experimentation because you know version one of circles was it would just orient in the direction of the controller but then uh you know it was like hard to make certain shapes so in the process of trying to make certain shapes i was like uh this is how it should be um so let's see this is uh the one drawing tool that has some physics in it so it's just like drawing a line but adding gravity at the same time and does that have a destination that it goes to like are you calculating a, a target at the moment that they're at the spray no it just has gravity applied to it at okay. the moment that it's drawn uh so let's see my favorite tool is uh david is it possible if you take if you turn the static camera on can you put it behind your head where the controllers are visible or is that not possible uh i intentionally made the controllers not visible with okay. the static camera no, so no, that, that be, makes little sense so that could be a performance tool so this is um uh, gravity and then if i pop into a drawing tool and i can kind of like draw into uh, the tornado in a nice way. Cool. So is this, are you actually like drawing 3 million particles right now? One for each eye and then what's going to the screen also? Three cameras? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. What And what GPU is this for anyone wondering? Oh, uh, um, what I told you what I got. Was it a 3070? I think that's what I got. Well, in, in a laptop, right? On a laptop, yeah. Okay. So that's pre still pretty impressive, simulating 3 million particles. And we can push it. I mean, if you want, I can show you what it looks like with way more particles. It's, it'll get unhappy, but it'll do sure. it. Sure, let's try it, especially with this extra camera. I'm sure it's... Oh, you also need to do some stamps before we're done. Okay, so let's see. What can we turn it up to here? Should we just go all the way up and see sure. if it... Okay, so if, uh, if if this crashes and I get kicked out of the chat, you know what happened. <laughs> okay, and goodbye. right. Yeah. It, was, it was nice knowing if, if you David, If David gets kicked out, I'll say goodbye and we'll end the stream. My GPU is going to get very angry. Well, oh, because you're in code. You're also encoding video, right? At the same time for for the stream. So this is going to be great. Okay, we might. Well, oh, that's there. Oh, look at that. Actually, not not so bad at six million particles. Hey, well, and and six million for two cameras in your head and a in a in a tertiary camera. Uh, so one detail that okay. So I don't know if you can tell on your end, but the frame rate's much worse on my end. But not 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 as bad as I would have thought. So something that I like to do is you know it's like if i'm making things to save or for prints or whatever i'll just you know i'll turn up the particle count and not worry about the frame rate if i'm doing performance stuff then frame rate matters um sure. but one so there's a thing called overdraw which is if you have lots of transparent surfaces uh, it will draw more slowly and by turning down the brightness it's actually not changing the brightness of the particles it's making them smaller and that actually improves performance oh so because of the less Transparent overdraw. Hmm. Yeah. So now that I've, uh, I don't know if you can tell on your end, but now that I've shrunk the particles, they're actually running almost in real time on my side, even at six billion. So it's pretty. So good. I have a, another slightly nerdy question here. So the the texture of this is there an actual texture you're sampling, or is it just something that's generated like a ramp that you're just generating in the shader? Yeah, I, I've gone back and forth with that. Um, I have tried versions where it is just calculating a ramp in the frag shader. Uh, but I, I think it's faster to sample a texture. So that is what I'm doing. That that always seems to be true for whatever reason. GPUs are just really good at sampling textures, turns out. So there is actually, and this is another thing that I just want to say out loud that maybe someone someday will listen to and think is interesting the way that I do. But the way Unity, the way you have to do this on Unity, and I guess it's because of cross-platformness, is you are kind of individually drawing a mesh, right? Like you you have a triangle or sorry, like a, what a two triangle quad basically that you're just essentially instancing 6 million times. Yep, exactly. Um, which for anyone interested, anyone who's used 3JS and WebGL, WebGL has an alternate mode where you can just tell the GPU to do that and it will do it for you. Like it will basically draw a point, a single point sent to the GPU as a as a like billboarded quad, which in theory, I guess, is like a quarter of the information because it's less vertices. But um, I've, I've never quite understood why Unity can't do that. I assume it's just because Unity has to ship to a lot of platforms. But um, are you talking about GL points? GL points, Unity, 
GL points can be rendered as quads in 3JS or in WebGL, I guess, which is OpenGL ES2, mm -hmm. I think. Um, which is why, you know, when I showed high score a minute ago, I think that's why I can get so many particles in a web browser with reasonable performance, um, just using using that thing. And even was able to like 10 years ago, get a lot of particles. Um, anyway, I, maybe somebody knows the actual reason for that and will tell me someday, but it's always been kind of weird to me that to do this, you are actually drawing a little square billboarded towards the camera and putting an image on it rather than just treating it like a point the way you might want to. Uh, yeah, that would be a little more ideal, unless, you know, un until I can figure out how to make it streak, in which case, uh, you right. know, points like that wouldn't work as well. Uh, yeah, version one of, I mean, it's getting like, you know, uh, uh, nerdy, but version one of Cosmic Sugar uh, required that I actually have one giant mesh with uh, all the quads, like, in that mesh. So I needed to make and I couldn't just make one mesh because at the time, Unity didn't allow you to have meshes that had more than 64,000 triangles. Right. So I actually had to have, you know, 10 or 20 different meshes. Uh, you know, each one you know, had different UVs, basically. And that's how it knew how to uh, position itself in space. So it's so much easier now. And for someone who has no idea what we're talking about, I mean, it, 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 you could deep dive on it, certainly. But it, just the way modern GPUs draw things is typically just as a bunch of triangles. And so if you see a cube, it is, what, 12 triangles? It's just triangles arranged in such a way that they will look like a cube. And that's how everything you see basically, not entirely, but basically what you see on the screen in, in, in games, any objects in the scene really are just a ton of triangles with, with some exceptions. And that's really what's happening here, which is kind of weird to think about. But every single one of these points is Sorry, did you say two, it's, a, it's a mesh with two triangles mm -hmm, to make yeah. a square? Yeah, so even here, even though it's not intuitive, th the same thing is happening here. It is a, um, th the screen is just covered in, I guess, 12 million triangles, right? If there's 6 million particles. Mm, yep. Ooh, I like that. Kind of cymatic. Yeah, those are my favorite ones. Yeah, it's got some cymatics going on. So as a design decision, this is something that I was, you know, trying to figure out as I was working uh, with it, the last version of Cosmic Sugar, this cymatics brush was static, but for the new one, I am actually animating the waves. So they kind of, the waves kind of wave, and I'm still not sure if I made the right choice by having the waves wave. I might go back to static for the future, but. Um... And sorry, that, that responsiveness, is it responsive to the audio or is it just kind of like? It's there, the waves are just waving. Got it. Is there any, you don't have any audio response? Responsiveness, do you? I thought that was something maybe you were thinking about or testing at one point. Uh, I did have it in the original version, but um, it, like I didn't take the time to get it set up in a way that was very satisfying, and I I have never like missed um, audio responsiveness. I basically just connected the amplitude of audio to the strength of different forces, and uh, I've like in any situation where I'm working with music, I just prefer to be able to control that myself. And people often think that, you know, during live performances that it is actually driven by the music. Yeah, because um, they just want it to be, just like. Because it's, I mean, it's just not hard to make things that, you know, go with the music. If something has a rhythm, then, you know, you can make things happen at that rhythm. And then it, you know, sure. it seems like it's driven by the music, even though it's just you doing it. So I have one more nerdy question, and then maybe we'll, maybe we'll sign off, is the way so I imagine there's a fair amount of noise and randomness underneath a lot of these brushes, right? Um, or no, is there not? No, actually not really. There's only one, like the, I have a noise brush, which is Perlin noise. Okay. So um, everything but... else is, I, I guess the, the question I have, and maybe you've thought of this, and I, I'm just curious how deterministic is how deterministic is one session of this? Because I'm really curious about like a multi-user VR, like a multi-user VR in present in space version of Cosmic Sugar where like multiple people are gathered around. Um, would you be able to, just based on their movements, would everyone see the same thing or what do you think? Uh, yes, it is very deterministic. So, you know, the, the initial particle positions are randomized 
but if they weren't randomized and everybody's frame rates were the same, then everybody would have the same experience. Interesting. And um, you know, even if you are working with different platforms or with people who might have uh, variable frame rates potentially, which is where you know variability would come in, uh, if you if you know that's going to happen, you can kind of do a performance in a way where you're like you know uh, always bringing the particles back to the center at some point, you know, to make sure that uh, uh, you know we similar. But yeah, that's how that's how you know performance capture works in Cosmic Sugar. If I hit record. I record the positions of my controllers and what forces are being applied. And that just goes out to a giant text file with, you know, basically JSON objects one after the next. It's totally inefficient right now. I might need your help with that for the future. <laughs> um, but then when it gets played back, it's just like, you know, one frame after the next. And it it does a great job. It's just like it's the same thing, but then you know, there's no frame drops and it can be at high res and all of that stuff. You can add more particles when you play it back to capture it, that kind of thing. So yeah, it it is deterministic for sure. Cool. So unless you unless you want to just play for a while, I think we're about finished. Or what do you think? Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give some, uh, and I can actually provide Steam keys too, even though that's a slightly older version. But I'm going to give some Steam key, uh, keys for the Oculus Quest uh, 2 version. And if anybody's interested, I also have this version that I've been playing with on my PC that is, as of now, unreleased. It needs to get released. Um, if you would like a copy of that, I can just send you that PD build as a cool. As a file. Yeah. So let's let's coordinate on that stuff, and I'll throw all those links into the YouTube description. So I think, um, yeah, I I don't know what to say. It is so. I guess a couple things. So thank you so much for sharing on that. That has been so interesting over the years to like watch this evolve. I actually remember one of the very first conversations we ever had. I feel like at ITP now close to 10 years ago, right? Something like that was, I think it was about some particle thing that I was doing in 3JS maybe. I mean, I really think that was one of the first times we ever talked was about 3JS. And so oh. just to see you going from there, which, you know, we, you were just getting started with programming, but obviously had a, a, a career behind you and lots of skill in, 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 in design and animation and visual effects, but just totally new in this. And just to see where you are now is really, it's really been interesting to watch this kind of evolve over time. Um, so I think that's awesome. I think, again, I'm going to say, I told you this recently, but I really think there needs to be like a desktop version of Cosmic Sugar and then we can network it. And then you can do uh, uh, met remote meditation streams for people in headsets or on their desktops. Uh, but in the meantime, everyone can try Cosmic Sugar uh, if you don't have access to a headset, watch some videos of it or come in to SETI um, either for the hackathon or just contact. Maybe let's do this. Let's remove this. We'll throw up. Uh, if you are in the Portland area, we'll, you can write to hello at SETI.institute or visit SETI.institute to learn more. Um, you can bother David at uh, go to CosmicSugarVR.com. Is there some contact info there or should we put some more contact info for you? Uh, I think I put up, uh, uh, yeah, throw up some contact info for me. Somewhere. Okay, which, it was a date, uh, which light clinic email? What, what do we want uh, here? Let's see. Uh, how about, yeah, let's try David at light.clinic. David think. at light.clinic. How fast I'll, can I do this? Does this I'll, work? I'll test that to make sure it works. Look at that. Um, that looks, that looks, it looks like a believable email. So thanks for joining us. And for anybody watching this in the future, please, I would be very curious to know. Um, this was this is kind of the first time that we've done a stream like this that's sort of deep divey. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, the we certainly, as you saw, I was resisting going really deep into talking about sort of the art and creative side. Really, uh, lots of opportunities to talk about the tech side. So if you have any thoughts, comments, questions on that, please add a comment below. We would really be interested to hear that as we go forward. And maybe if you're interested, we could get David to come back and do like a little bit of a deeper dive on the code side or a little bit of a deeper dive on the on the creative performance side. So with that, I will end with the reminder once again, just so I'm doing doing my job with that Nandini here, uh, to visit seti.institute. Uh, David, thanks again so much for joining us. And now we have to do the really unceremonious, um, just remove people from the chat because I, or from the stream, because I haven't figured out how to do it better in, uh, in, in StreamYard. So David, thank you so much. And I will let you say goodbye. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share my work. And uh, uh, I think I'm probably going to see everybody at the hackathon. So I look forward to that too. Bye.